Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for hearing this. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about quantification of uh, anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions from California at scales ranging from the entire state down to individual facilities. Uh, give you a very brief overview of efforts on bottom-up emission estimates, essentially inventory development, but with spatial resolution. Uh, and then tell you about top-down measurements using the atmosphere effectively as a test tube to gauge emissions in a uh, spatially and temporally sensitive manner. This will include regional emission measurements and inverse modeling. I'll spend a fair amount of time on that. Uh, some results on methane, nitrous oxide, and fossil fuel CO2 emissions uh, from that work. And then a little bit more focus on natural gas methane emissions at facility scales. Uh, first, I should say that this is a collaborative effort. It involves multiple institutions across California and outside California. Uh, it could not be done in a single sort of investigator mode. It's something that requires collaboration because there's so much information that needs to go into it. I uh, just note that both the California Air Resources Board, the California Energy Commission, the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, have also contributed both financially and intellectually to this effort. Uh, putting greenhouse gas emissions in a sort of overview context, uh, everyone is here, I think, aware that we are leading the way, we hope, toward a sustainable future in which greenhouse gas emissions are brought to a reasonable level both the Climate Solutions Act and the Governor's executive orders are placing excessively more stringent requirements on our emissions, and getting a handle on that from multiple perspectives is going to be essential. I'm going to tell you mostly about non-CO2 greenhouse gases today, but I just want to start by saying the figure on the right shows total greenhouse gas emissions as a function of time from 1990 to present, roughly. Uh, and blue bars show that by far and away the majority of our emissions are coming from fossil fuel CO2 combustion. And there is no substitute in solving this problem for reducing those emissions. I'm now going to focus more on the non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions because they are more uncertain in a relative sense than the not in the CO2 we can tell how much fuel is being burned, but we really can't tell how much cows are burping or landfills are uh, emitting. I'll go into more detail on that. Uh, this work will look across spatial scales and now temporal scales to look at all the way from the state as a total down to individual facilities with the hope that we can in the future make measurements that quantify emissions not only at sort of how are we doing overall, but how are individual areas and facilities doing in reducing their emissions over time. Big picture, when you want to look at a huge area like the state of California, you need to take an approach that incorporates data from across the state with essentially a measurement model comparison. And what I'm going to now tell you about is called an inverse emission estimate. And I want to say just a little bit about what the word inverse means. It means we are estimating emissions based on atmospheric concentrations in the atmosphere. We're not actually able to put a test tube over every patch of California and just uniquely identify it. We take air from all over California and measure its enhancement relative to air flowing into California and what I'm showing here in this figure is first California specific greenhouse gas emission measurements or California greenhouse gas specific measurements, the little yellow dots in the upper left on the map of California, a model or actually measurements of greenhouse gas background that are made by NOAA off the coast of California and all the way up to Alaska. And then a greenhouse gas emission model. And I'll say a little bit more about each of those. We combine those with a model for atmospheric transport and then compare what we call the measured signals in California with predicted signals based on the emission model that transport and the background to, in a statistical sense, determine whether
whether our original estimate of emissions is accurate or if it needs revision. That leads to an improved emission estimate. I'm happy to talk to you more in detail about that. I'll say more as we go on here. Let me start by saying greenhouse gases are long-lived in the atmosphere, and as such, they end up with a large background level relative to local enhancement. That is, when you look at the background for, for example, methane in this figure, this is measured at a tower just 30 miles south of here near Walnut Grove, California. There is a large level which stays constant, essentially, in the atmosphere, at least for methane over the last roughly decade, uh, at about 2,000 parts per billion, or two, two parts per million. On top of that background, there is a local enhancement, which is due to emissions from the area that's influencing air at that tower. And in the bottom of this figure, you see what is called local minus background enhancement, which is on order, an order of magnitude lower than that background. I'm just saying this because I want to emphasize that making these measurements requires great stability and accuracy in order that one can determine that enhancement relative to background. And methane is sort of in the middle between some gases that are, <clears throat> well, I would say methane is probably one of the easiest to measure uh, the local enhancement of. Uh, nitrous oxide, which I'll show you later, is very difficult because the enhancement is so tiny relative to the background. Now, very briefly about the measurements. How do you do this? You find places in California that are separated from strong local sources of emission, and typically you try to find tall towers so that you can be essentially sampling a big, big block of representative atmosphere. We've now, and others, have found towers across California that serve these essentially as sentinel sites measuring that greenhouse gas uh, concentration over time in an accurate manner. In order to make the measurement accurate, there are detailed instrument sets that are put at each site that include both uh, spectrometers, infrared spectrometers for measuring the gas concentration, and calibration gases that have been all referenced to the same standard as the background measurements that are made off the coast of California. In addition, class measurements are used to trace other gases, keep track of the continuous measurements made by the spectrometers, and offer an avenue toward identifying what the sources of the different gases are through correlations with other gas species, for example, uh, volatile organic compounds. Now, Having made the measurements, we need to compare with a model for emissions in California. And this figure shows a model that we've developed for methane. And what this shows is the strength of the emission from the surface as a function of position across California overlaid with measurement sites that are currently measuring methane in California. And this is really a little bit out of date. Riley Duran will tell you in a few minutes about very detailed study that's focusing down on the Los Angeles and sort of South Coast air basin with many more sites, and I look forward to his talk in that respect. This model incorporates a mixture of what we call activity data, that is how many cows are where, how many landfills are there, and process-based models for emissions from wetlands, Bill Hollis will tell you perhaps a little bit about that, uh, and generates what is effectively a zeroth order or what we call an a priori model for emissions, which we then use to compare with the measurements. In order to compare it, we have to take those surface emissions and turn them into, essentially map them to concentration enhancements expected in the atmosphere. And the way we do that is with the transport model. The model that we use is the National Center for Atmospheric Research Weather Research Forecast, or WARF model, I'm sorry I didn't spell it all out here, combined with a stochastic time-inverted Lagrangian transport model, or SILT. The purpose of this combined system is, as I said, to produce essentially a, a mapping from the 
those emissions I showed you to the enhancements we'd expect at a given tower site. This model has been developed essentially for decades in various different forms, and we're now using it to estimate the emissions through this inverse model. We've done a comparison with both meteorological measurements across the state and with carbon monoxide measurements, which for which there are relatively well-known emissions. At this point, a preliminary estimate is the bias in these models can be limited to less than 10% on a statewide annual scale. So that effectively, in my current thinking, estimates a limit to which I would feel confident saying there is or isn't a difference between an emission model estimate, inverse model estimate, and a current existing sort of inventory-based estimate for emissions. Now, we've done this work for several different gases, but I'm going to show you results for methane, nitrous oxide, and fossil fuel CO2. For methane, through work combining the California Air Resources Board, uh, some of our sites, and collaborating sites across the state in the 13-site network, We've estimated emissions for the June 2013 to May 2014 period using a statistical inverse model that we call hierarchical Bayesian model, and I can go into more detail about that later. Uh, but let me just say that this model allows us to estimate both the emission estimate and an uncertainty in the emission estimate with spatial resolution at roughly 0 0.3 degrees in this current implementation. The preliminary results are shown on the right. It's the figure showing summertime emissions of methane estimated from this combination of prior model, transport, and measured signals across the state. And what you see are emissions in the northern Sacramento Valley dominated by rice, in the San Joaquin Valley dominated by livestock, and in the southern San Joaquin, a certain amount of emissions from oil and gas, and then in South Coast Air Basin, combination of landfills, livestock, and other oil and gas activities. Together, the Central Valley, dominated by livestock, and the South Coast Air Basin and San Francisco Bay areas comprise most of the estimated methane emissions. With a total of about 2.4 to 2.7 in this uh, sort of, I would call it roughly 68% uh, confidence level uh, interval, that's equivalent to roughly one and a half times the current state inventory. And we're now working to finalize our estimates of transport model bias to say whether that 10% estimate on possible bias applies here. I feel that it likely does. Now, I'm going to turn to another gas, nitrous oxide. For the purposes of a limited amount of time to talk with you, I'm not going to show you the reams of data that we've collected on each of these gases. You're welcome to come and talk to me later. What I will say is that for nitrous oxide, we have comparatively fewer sites. We have two sites in the, uh, or three sites in the San Joaquin Valley, a couple sites in uh, the South Coast Air Basin, and one over San Francisco. Combining those with a prior model, for methane emissions, which is based on, again, activity data, and also in this case, because natural emissions of nitrous oxide might be important, a forest model and an ocean upwelling model, we again estimate the anthropogenic component distinct from the forest and ocean upwelling, and the preliminary results suggest that for that 2013 to 2014 period, between 77 and 95 gigagrams of nitrous oxide are emitted, equivalent to roughly 1.6 to 2 times the current anthropogenic inventory. Again, this work is preliminary, and we are going to be finalizing it this fall. Last, I'm going to say a little bit about fossil fuel CO2 emissions. Again, really the big picture thing that everyone needs to come to grips with in dealing with this problem. Here, we're using radiocarbon to estimate emissions. 
And did anybody have a sense of the time? Because this thing doesn't show time. Ah, marvelous. Um, Thank you. Uh, here, radiocarbon is not present in fossil fuel. Radiocarbon has a lifetime of about 5,700 years and then decays to uh, other forms of carbon. Because of that, we can use the dilution of radiocarbon in the atmosphere caused by the fossil fuel to estimate how much fossil fuel is being added. It's actually a beautiful technique. It requires a very sensitive measure of a minute quantity of radiocarbon, so it is not easy. But there have been sufficient advances in the science that allow this, that we can now compare the total amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and with the amount that is enhanced by fossil fuel CO2, and the plot on the sort of middle right shows in black local minus background total CO2 at a site, again, near Walnut Grove, California, and in red, the enhancement due to the radiocarbon. If we compare that measured enhancement in radiocarbon with a predicted enhancement in radiocarbon over multiple years, we find that essentially the measurements are consistent with the a priori information at this site, suggesting that within roughly 10%, the emissions of fossil fuel are likely consistent with the existing inventory for fossil fuel CO2 emissions. This is not tremendously surprising because the inventory estimates are quite good. We know how much fuel is being burned. Doing this for multiple sites will give us a handle across the state. And uh, we've started some work for two sites in the South Coast Air Basin that are similar, but with more noise. We have less data there. And uh, we'll be saying more about that this coming fall. Now, in the last few minutes, I'm going to focus on methane and, again. But here we're going to step down in spatial scale. Here we've done an estimate of methane emissions from just the San Francisco Bay Area that was possible because the Bay Area Air Quality Management District measured both carbon monoxide and methane emissions for several decades as part of the air quality control program. Comparing the slope of methane enhancement to CO enhancement in the atmosphere with an estimate of how much CO is emitted allows us to estimate that regional methane emissions are roughly one and a half to two times the Bay Area Air Quality Management District inventory. Again, more emission than the inventory we suggest, suggesting either our estimates from the known sources are underestimating or that there are some unidentified sources as yet. Oh. For the Bay Area, we're continuing this work with additional tracers to try to say how much of that local enhancement is due to something that is readily traceable to a given source. There we go. On a different front, we're also trying to now look across the state and say something about not only the fossil fuel, but also the biospheric CO2 exchange. And here, we're doing a project led by Heather Graven, who's now at Imperial College, where we're combining radiocarbon measurements with satellite observations of the total column of CO2 in the atmosphere to estimate this combination of biosphere and fossil fuel CO2. And I think in the next year, we'll have a fair amount more to say there. At local scales, I'm going to skip the regional inverse summary and focus on uh, natural gas emissions for a moment. An important part of our natural gas system is the consumption sector, which is over on the far right, which has not been identified in previous estimates of emissions. Here we're starting work with the California Energy Commission to estimate sort of these natural gas consumption subsectors, post meter. This is houses elsewhere. We've also done work now across facilities looking at San Joaquin Valley production. So this is at the upstream side. We're looking using an aircraft which can fly essentially a test tube around a given site to estimate emissions from the site based on the upwind 
or the downwind minus upwind enhancement of methane and the known wind. Preliminary estimates for one site in the Central Valley suggest emissions are roughly consistent with the bottom-up estimate that we produced using activity data for that site. We're continuing with other sites now. We've also done this same kind of work for both storage facilities in the Sacramento River Delta and three refineries in the Delta. There we find varying emissions with sometimes roughly consistent current inventories, sometimes more emissions than current inventories, and we're in sort of in the process now of trying to firm that up, and that'll be something that we're finishing this fall. Last, we've used a vehicle to move through the landscape on the ground and look at small methane leaks from individual street leaks or individual, when they are available, house leaks or commercial sector leaks. A drive through Sacramento last June showed roughly 150 leaks ranging from, are we out? I'm finished. Uh, ranging from 5 to 300 grams methane per hour. When we scale that to the consumption of Sacramento, we find that the total emissions are roughly a tenth of a percent of the consumption in the Sacramento area. Seems like a tiny amount, but because methane is a very strong greenhouse gas, this is something that we need to keep track of both for safety and greenhouse gas considerations. We've done this work also for Sacramento and the area with comparatively higher and lower results. Last, we've measured methane leakage from individual houses. The bottom line here is that for a sample of what were older houses in the Bay Area, emissions were roughly two-tenths of a percent of the consumption of those houses. We're in the process of publishing this work. It suggests that houses have infrastructure that is not always perfectly maintained and might be improved. We're now in the process of a study of many houses across the state. In summary, using the atmosphere as a test tube allows us to test whether emissions are consistent with current inventory estimates and identify the emissions from relatively localized areas that we can then judge over time progress on uh, mitigation efforts. Thank you.